Welcome to Puppy December, the, the holiday season. I'm surprised all you showed up. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm Alan, your friendly neighborhood MC. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, if you don't know me, come say hello after or during the break. Um, how many how many people is, this, is how many people are here for the first time? Oh wow, okay, a lot more than I expected. Great. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to Puppy. We love new, new, you know, first timers. Uh, I think this is a great meetup. I'm a little biased, obviously, but uh, welcome to Puppy. We're gonna have a we have a great meetup with you today. We have some uh, Python core developer, uh, and we have some other great speakers with us here today. Uh, but we'll kick it off with um, a little message from our sponsors, Redfin. Obviously, I don't know if you guys noticed, but you're in their offices. So, <laughs> uh, thank you, Redfin. This is Colin from Redfin. I won't pitch too hard. I'm Colin Burchett, I'm the engineering recruiter here in Seattle, uh, right now hiring for engineers and dev and test like crazy. Uh, we are primarily a Java shop, so feel free to do that since we're in the Python group. Um, we use Python, we use it deployment a little bit in DevOps, we script, but primarily we're Java. Uh, we're React on the front end, so that's cool. Uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, if you want to talk, I'll be at the back of the room later about hiring Java engineers. Uh, and if not, enjoy the pizza and beer. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, I'm going to start, to, we'll start with some, a lightning talk today. We have uh, Michael Patterson, right? Patterson, okay. He's a neuroscientist at UTEP, and he's got a pretty cool talk about predicting winners in League of Legends with uh, uh, using random forests, which will be pretty interesting. How many people here play League of Legends? Raise your hand. Oh, not as many as I expected. Wow. I mean, I guess last time I, was, I had a, a Dota talk and there weren't that many people either. But, uh, I still know we have to Yeah, I guess we have. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, well, I thought there'd be more people for you, but, you know, uh, but it should be interesting. So, here we go. Now I'll switch the AV to the Hi. So, yeah, as he said, I'm a neuroscientist at UW, and I've been trying to get interested more in data science and machine learning. And I figured a great way to do that is to do a side project with one of my favorite games, League of Legends. So if you don't play League of Legends, you might be wondering what it is. It's a team game where two teams are trying to destroy each other's base. Uh, each team has five players, and uh, the teams do a bunch of things during the game. You should probably know about four of them. Uh, the first thing is that the teams get gold from, from around the map, killing minions. And then obviously it's a team fighting game, so you're fighting each other, you're getting kills, and uh, there's a lot of that going on. And they said it's a base destruction game. So each team has towers that they're trying to defend, and they're also trying to destroy the other team's towers. And then finally, there are these creatures on the uh, map called dragons. And if you kill the dragon, you get this like great bonus that should help you uh, win the game. Okay. Uh, so the goal of my talk today using machine learning is to try and predict the winner of the game uh, before the game's over. And to draw an analogy, I'd like to go to poker. So in a poker match on ESPN, you'll see that they deal the cards to everyone, and then you can say, Kalakis has a 76% chance of winning, whereas Uday has a 24% chance of winning. And this is before the game's end. It's like when they have a few cards in their hand. So I'm gonna do the same thing for League of Legends, go five, 10 minutes into the game and say, this team has a 2,000 gold lead. Do they have a 75% chance of winning the game at that time point? Uh, so to get the data, the developer of the game, Riot Games, has a nice API that you can just use Python requests to get data from, and it returns a JSON that has all sorts of information in it. Uh, it has about the goal, the kills, uh, who the players were, what time of day it was, and things like that. Uh, and so for any good data science project, you want to start by exploring the data. And so one really simple thing we can look at is the game length. So most games last, which, uh, we have on the x-axis here the game length, and the y-axis is the fraction of games that last that long. And so between 30 and 40 minutes, uh, most games are lasting or any around that time. And we have this big spike at 20 minutes where you might be wondering what's going on here. What's happening is if you play this game for 10 minutes and you're losing terribly and you just want to like move on to the next game, you can't do it. You have to wait until 20 minutes before you can surrender. So that's why there's that big spike there. Uh, and so to do predictions, I'm going to use a pandas data frame, and we're going to get data every five minutes. So at the beginning of my data set, I have 35,000 games, and as the games end, you get less and less games until at 50 minutes, uh, there's only 500 games left in the data set. And so what do these data frames look like? It's just a table. I can use the match ID as an index for each game, and then we can have features for the goal difference and the kill difference, uh, 
And we can also have like who actually won the game in the end. So if you look at the second row, this team had a 10,000 gold lead, they had a big lead in towers and kills, and actually won the game at the end. So it seems like these are good predictors. But if you look at the third row, this team had a 2,400 gold lead, but they actually lost the game in the end. So there might be something a little more complicated going on or uh, less predictive. And if we're gonna be doing machine learning, we also wanna know whether there's any correlation between the variables, because we have to choose our algorithm depending on what the data looks like. And so to look at this, you can do a scatter matrix. I'd just like to draw your attention to the top one here, where you can look at the gold difference versus the kill difference. And so on the y-axis, we have like the gold difference, and if you have a lot more gold than the other team, you generally also have killed them more often than you've been killed in return. And, we, and machine learning, we call this multi-collinearity, and when you choose our model, we have to make sure that the model can handle this correlation and pick out which features are important. So this is just a brief overview of what the data looks like. Uh, we can finally get to machine learning. And so I decided to predict the winners with random forests for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that random forests are really good with multicollinearity, so we don't have to pre-process the data to uh, deal with that. The second thing is random forests will tell you which variables are important. And as a player, I want to know, like, is the dragon more important than the tower? And so that'll help me get that. And the third thing is I've never used random forests before, so I figured this is a good time to figure it out. Uh, so this is the result. Uh, I just used scikit-learn to generate this, and this is the plotting, the result of the accuracy. So on the x-axis here, again, we have time in the game, and the y-axis is the prediction accuracy. You can see just five minutes into this 30-minute game, you already have a 65% accuracy predicting who's going to win the game. And as you acquire more and more data about uh, this game is longer, the accuracy goes up to around 85% of 30 minutes, and then kind of counterintuitively, the accuracy goes down as the game gets larger and longer. And I think there's two main reasons this is happening. Uh, the first is like a selection or a survivor bias, that the only games that are going to last 50 minutes are games that are actually really close to each other, and so it makes it really hard to figure out who's going to win. And the second thing is that if you make a mistake really early in the game, it probably doesn't matter that much and you're not gonna lose the game, but if it's really late in the game, if you make a small mistake, the other team can just win the game pretty quickly. So that's what I think is going on there. And then finally, as I said, Random forests are great because they'll tell you about which features are actually important and help you win the game. And so you can plot with scikit-learn the feature importance. And so on the axis here is the importance of each feature. Then I have six different features here. Uh, the text might be a little small. We have gold difference and kill difference, etc. And so the two most important features are these golden kill difference. I'm going to skip these middle features and just point out the least important features of these six is the dragon difference. So you'd think like killing the dragon would be like great, right? You get a big lead, but it turns out dragons don't really matter for League of Legends. Uh, so that's my lightning talk. If you'd like more information, I have uh, the source code for scraping everything and doing the machine learning on my GitHub account. And I also have some uh, IPython notebooks you can go through to look at things. And I also have a couple uh, blog posts about this on my blog. Thanks. Great. We got time for a few questions. If anyone has questions, just raise your hand. Sure. Uh, the graphs you showed us, how many games did you snarf in to generate them? Uh, so in total, for this data set, it's 35,000 games. So there's like different regions of the world. You can get Korean games or European games. So in total, I have like 200,000 between everything. But just for this, is 35,000. Yeah. What, what's the big difference between the regional areas? Is it really that big of a difference? Uh, Korean or, or US or so there is one small difference in Korea they are very if they're losing the game early they don't want to wait until 20 minutes to surrender so they'll do something where they call open mid and they just all like sit in their base and let the other team destroy it really quickly and so you can actually get better prediction accuracy during the first 15 minutes because the Korean players want to lose sometimes all right yeah <laughs> I have, yes. So if you do like really, one thing is those skill games take longer than high skill games because high skill players are better at taking advantage of things. And so if you compare like a team game, which like professional players versus low skill players, they actually, uh, you get about five to 10% higher accuracy during the first set of time and then it goes on afterwards, yeah. <laughs> Wait, what's that? He wants to see a graph of your own. Oh, of my own mini percentage? It, it's gone down as I've done more modeling. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one in the back. Yeah. 
so the question is if the characters matter they do there's about 130 characters in the game and uh i would like to do that in the future but that would also go i have right now i have like 20 features and that may give me 150 features and everything would take a lot longer to run so just just buy more process power <laughs> duh i would like to do that <laughs> How correlated the skill level with machine learning? I don't quite understand. Are you are you writing an AI? To, to oh, am I like trying to write an AI to play the game? Ooh. No, that's beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> One back. Yeah, so there's a most recent patch that sped the game up by about two minutes, and you can also see the game becomes more predictable by a couple percent during the initial time. Yeah. So, um, I'm looking at um, trying to predict the actual game length, uh, and I imagine if you're at 20 minutes, and the game only lasts 25, you're probably at a better prediction actual game. If you're at 20 minutes, the game ends at 50 minutes. Right, so I think one thing I could do to present the data more clearly is to show like a range of predictability. And so for each game with scikit-learn, you can get the probability of winning. And then you can look at that rather than just saying whether or not it predicts the winner. All right. Do the features change in time over the length of the game? Like, will you find at the beginning of the game a certain feature is more important in a later stage of the game than other features? Uh, yeah. uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so as the game goes on, Gold's really important at the beginning, and then there are like other things like barons or inhibitors, which is just League of Legends jargon, but these things become really much more important because they give you like an advantage later in the game. Yeah. Right. All right. That's, uh, that's it for questions. Thank you. <laughs> so next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Brett Cannon. He's a core Python developer. Currently, he works at uh, Microsoft as a principal engineer, I think. I don't really know what that means. It's, it's a title. It's a title. Do you want to sit or whatever you want to stand? All right, cool. So, uh, so this is Brett Cannon, core Python developer. Everyone say hello. And then, uh, I've got some questions for you. So before, while I'm looking at my questions, let's just get started. Uh, how about you tell a little, everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do, uh, and how you got involved with Python, maybe? Yep, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as Alan mentioned, uh, my name's Brett. I live up in Vancouver. That one, not that one. Um, I work at Microsoft. Uh, I work actually on the Python team at Microsoft. Yes, there is an actual Python team there. Um, and we are hiring uh, Python jobs at Microsoft.com. So I just got my 520 toll covered. Um, basically, uh, I'm kind of an internal consultant, um, kind of answering questions for various teams. We've got some things in the pipeline I can't talk about. Uh, I'm also working part time on trying to add a JIT to C Python called Pigeon. That's a YJ and an IG on GitHub. Um, we're still working on it, so I'm not going to go into much detail about that. Hopefully I'll get a talk submitted and actually accepted at PyCon, and hopefully I'll have something more in May. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Is that the one that uh, Dino's doing? That's the one Dino's doing. Dino and I are working on that together. So Dino Veland, who also works at Microsoft, that Larry just mentioned, uh, started it at PyCon this past April when Larry said, we should get more Python 3 users. Let's make Python faster. And Dino went, oh, I know. I know the .NET JIT really well. Let's see if I can shove that into CPython. And so he did it, and it worked. So now I get to help him out uh, part-time to try to make sure it actually pans out and actually is worth something. Too bad it's closed source. No, it's not. It's on GitHub. GitHub.com slash Microsoft slash P-Y-J-I-O. Um, in terms of how... programming and back in t the fall of 2000 it seemed to be at a Python or Perl and everything said make Perl your sixth programming language you learn uh, <laughs> and all you see at the time so I went with Python and turned out to be the right decision um, in terms of how I got on the, the core team I actually have the last and the longest recipe in the first edition of the Python cookbook um, and as a graduation gift to myself I made it better um, yeah I'm kind of sick uh, and I asked Alex Martelli, uh, how do I get this into the Star library? Because it was implementing time uh, dot stir p time, which parses um, date fields. And basically, I went to Python dev, 
as Alex said to do, and I asked, how do I get this in? And they said, well, submit a patch. And they went through it, and they accepted it, and I was taking a year off at the time. So I just stayed on Python Dev because I found it interesting. Um, I started to write the Python Dev summaries at the time, every two weeks, where I just summarized all the email I wrote for the past two weeks. Uh, and doing that meant I had to learn a lot of the internals, which led to me actually submitting patches because I had the time. And then eventually at one point, Guido said, well, why don't you just commit it? And I was like, well, I don't have commit patches. He's like, oh, you do now, just go commit yourself. Um, that was back when you can actually get that to happen because the team was a lot smaller. Because back in 2003, Python was turning upwards, but it was still, oh, is that the language with white space? <laughs> so much different time in terms of community size and such. Cool. So, like, uh, so I'll start. I'll, I'll start with the first question. I think. Um, so I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. It looks like you have a master's and a PhD in computer science, which I don't see particularly often. Um, I was kind of curious as to why you pursued a master's and a PhD in computer science. I mean, a, a lot of people go for their bachelor's and then they decide that academic life is not for them. But clearly, it seems to me, well, maybe it's not clear that academic life isn't for you either because you're at Microsoft, you were at Google prior. So I was kind of interested in learning about why you pursued a PhD, and also now you work for Corporate America or Canada, uh, if you will. Uh, so I was kind of curious about that. Okay, there's a story behind that one. Um, so when I went to junior college, my mom made me promise her two things. I would take a philosophy class, and I would take a computer science class. I did both, I loved both equally. Uh, I wanted to actually double major in philosophy and computer science, but I was a transfer student down in California, and they had the unit cap, and when I was trying to get up to the point to be able to double major, I called them up when I got accepted to, um, I went to Berkeley, and they said, oh yeah, there's a unit cap, you probably won't be able to graduate if you try to get in the CS department and don't get in, so you should probably just get your philosophy degree. Uh, so I did, uh, and but I still wanted that CS degree. And at the time, I did think I actually wanted to go in academia. Um, my grandfather was a team of students at Cal, um, Cal State LA. Uh, my mom was a fourth grade teacher. I come from a long line of teachers, so I thought maybe I wanted to go in academics. Uh, so I did the masters. Uh, that was my way to get from a philosophy degree to something with enough CS background to actually get a PhD. Uh, I did it, and then I learned I hate grading and writing tests. Um, but I do love lecturing and giving talks like this. So I basically just decided I can keep doing the open source, I can keep giving talks, while also having the freedom to live where I want to live instead of where the university says I have to go live. Great. All right, so now I think we'll, we'll open up the questions to the crowd. I, I'm assuming some people here have some questions uh, about Python in general or, or maybe just software development in general. I think this guy's kind of an expert, so. Uh, so raise your hand if you have a question and then uh, we'll start picking them. Anyone? Anyone? Ed? You with the glasses. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, is what's the easiest way basically to get involved in development of Python? Um, it's actually kind of hard. Uh, I took some time off between my PhD and I used to work at Google before I um, went full time at Google and I wrote something called the um, Python Dev Guide. You can go to docs.python.org slash devguide, D-E-V-G-U-I-D-E. And it's a document that basically outlines how to get started. The, the problem is, is as you all know, Python's been around for quite a while. I mean, Guido started the project. Uh, I started writing it over in December 1989, and it went open source, I believe, February 20th, 1991. So it's not exactly a new language that needs help because we need boots on the ground in order to get up and going. So there's no real specific area that needs specific help. I mean, there are some modules, for instance, in the started library that always could use some more love. Um, there's always bugs. Uh, they need either a patch or someone to come along and just look at a patch and just say, hey, I looked at this and it looks reasonable to me. I mean, even if you're not a core dev, that's still helpful because it means we don't have to worry about little details <coughs> if someone can go, yeah, I ran it and it worked. Um, more test coverage never hurts. Um, it's just unfortunately hard to find that little niche that needs the help because so many people are usually so gung-ho to try to help that usually there's a swarm of people and anything that's easy and then someone gets it, which is great, but it's also just, um, having enough work for everyone to do, on top of having a shortage of core developers to actually review the patches, which I'm currently working on. And Larry, who's our release manager, has something to say. Well, I just kind of wanted to nudge in that direction. Yeah, yeah. No, but the, 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 it's nice that people want to help Python, but fundamentally we have sort of a workflow problem where it's impossible to get changes into Python unless you're 
um, unless you have the commit bit or you're really good friends with someone who has the commit bit. It's like people uh, send us bugs and occasionally they send us fixes and sometimes those will get through and a lot of times they'll sort of language in the bug, language in the bug tracker. And so uh, somebody is trying to change that as well. Um, they're in the room. I'm hoping maybe they'll say something about it. So what Larry's alluding to is I seem to have a nasty habit of about every four years trying to improve the development process for Python. Uh, I started with getting us off of SourceForge uh, and onto our own setup with Subversion and uh, Roundup for Issue Tracker. Uh, I'm the guy that put us off of Subversion onto Mercurial, and now I'm the guy getting us off of our kind of home-brewed custom workflow to something a bit more sane. Um, off of Mercurial. I'm getting there, Larry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so currently I'm, I'm evaluating uh, options of either sticking with what we got, which is basically you upload a patch to Roundup, uh, I as a core dev apply the patch, run the tests, make sure it works, apply it to 3.5 if, if it applies there, uploading it, um, up merging into the main default branch and then pushing that up. Um, the other option is moving us to Git and GitHub, uh, and the other option is moving us to Git and GitLab. Uh, I'm currently evaluating basically GitLab and GitHub to see which one I prefer in terms of support for hosting. Um, it doesn't make a difference that so many people are on GitHub versus the open sourceness of GitLab, the exact feature parities and not, how to handle our workflow because it's, it, we're not a normal open source project, right, where you have like, everything goes into the current branch and we just cut a new one in like three months. We have an 18 month development cycle, which means we have bug fixes open, where Larry here has to cut a release every six months. So there's always work in one branch to another. How does that work with Git? Because none of these um, systems are really designed to support these long separate branches and how we're gonna handle that. Uh, I'm hoping to make a decision by July 1st, um, July 1st, January 1st, um, that hopefully will, well, honestly it's gonna upset a lot of people, but who cares. Uh, I gotta suck it up because someone's gonna be happy that it's GitHub and someone's gonna be happy that it's GitLab because it's open source and someone's gonna cry and be mad at me, but that's just, I'm used to it. Um, but yeah, hopefully next year it's gonna get cleaned up and better and we'll be able to be faster in terms of accepting patches because one of the key things with this workflow change is not, not to necessarily make it easier for you to commit. I don't wanna make it any worse for you, but I wanna make it easier for me and Larry here to actually accept patches because if we can do that, we can get through the backlog faster, you'll have a better experience, we'll have a better experience, and everyone will just be happier. Yes? Well, uh, uh, I just wonder about the performance. If you convert it over to .NET and uh, you include a JIT and everything, uh, you know, the big complaint about Python is, it, is the speed is slower and slower. How does it compare, how do your results compare to the JVM? Well, so I gave the opening keynote at PyCon Canada, and if you go to PyVideo or YouTube, you can look up my uh, opening keynote where I actually go over the performance of all the current uh, implementations, which is CPython, CPython with performance guided optimizations, Jython, Iron Python, and our experimental pigeon. Um, it's still, it's too early to really give too much number details. Uh, our experiment is, not even fully done, I wouldn't even call it necessarily alpha software, so it's too early to really say that it's gonna work. And obviously the workloads are gonna be different in terms of having to have the JIT warm up and stuff, just like the PyPy people would tell you, uh, and they benchmark PyPy. Um, we don't know yet, I mean, it's just an experiment just to see if it works and if it's even feasible. As I said, it's we just don't know yet, so we're hoping, but we won't know until we're done and we're willing to say, yes, it worked and didn't. And I would also say Python's not slow. <laughs> it's definitely fast enough most of the time, but I'm biased. Uh, is there a pet or feature coming in the future that you're most excited about? All right, I'm going to take that and give the softball answer because um, <laughs> Eric Smith, uh, Eric V. Smith, has already committed something in Python 3.6 that a lot of people have been very happy about. Uh, we're going to be getting what we're calling F strings. Uh, in Python 3.6, which is basically if you pre add an F prefix, uh, much like adding an R for a raw string or a U in Python 2.7 for a Unicode string, uh, you can actually embed in curly braces the name of a local variable and it'll actually do the string interpolation directly. So you won't have to call dot format anymore. It'll literally just do it. And because it requires... Yeah. Yeah. So if you move to Python 3.6, you can get nice, nice new features. So take that, two seconds. Change, yeah, take that. <laughs> uh, there's a little extra performance there, and I think Eric even said it now beats out on percent S string interpolation. So.
I like that one. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Yeah, just, just for meditation or, or like, what are the underlying algorithms that you use? Is there a place that I can go to for Python and other than that? <laughs> Larry has an answer. So, um, 2008, I think, uh, Python. Oh, so, the, the question was, um, the the person was interested in uh, the performance of Python built-ins, I think, right? Uh, the question was: Is there somewhere to find uh, to look at standard algorithms and look up their complexity written in Python so that they're easier to follow and understand? Correct. Um, I think Project Euler might be a good place to look. Uh, it's basically a website where people re-implement multiple algorithms and little toy examples in different languages just to be able to have an example. Like, well, if I know Python and I can now look at this written in Dart or TypeScript or whatever and kind of see how it works. Um, Past that, I don't know of any specific website. You probably just search for whatever algorithm you're looking for, Python, and I'm sure someone's written it somewhere. Um, and in terms of the complexity, that's just such an academic thing. I don't know beyond a, um, one of the core algorithm books. How you necessarily look that up without <laughs> staring at the algorithm, just counting how many loops there are nested and go, oh, all right, well, that's end of the blank, and there you go. Are you familiar with a site called Rosetta Code, which may be an answer to her question? So, uh, Jim Lenapier also suggested Rosetta Code on top of Project Euler to also uh, find examples. Uh, so, yeah. so, you've worked at a couple of companies that probably protect their IP pretty well, and you're committing a lot to open source. How do you manage that conversation with who you work for, and, and how do you split your time? Like, where, where's that accountability, and what's that relationship like? So the question was, uh, being such a big open source guy, guy, how do I work for a closed source company and how do I work the balance? Um, so at Google, um, I basically took 20% time, as I think most people probably know they offer, and I basically just spent every Friday working on Python. So I was working on Google Now and various other things, which is obviously all closed source. Um, but we got to use some open source software in there and various things, but I mean, for me, I just do it because I enjoy it and I get some enjoyment out of giving back to the Python community and just do, doing that and being part of the great project and all that. So working on closed source has never really bothered me specifically. Uh, in terms of Microsoft, I'm still doing my work every Friday, but also getting to work on something open source was actually one of the, other than moving to Vancouver, one of the reasons I went to Microsoft was because I knew I was gonna get to actually work on open source as my actual direct job, not just something I did once a week just because. Um, but I mean, I don't know. It's just, I could, from a Microsoft Microsoft perspective, it's really trying to push open source now. As you probably heard, like Chakra, the JavaScript engine for Edge desk open source has become the thing now kind of internally to open source whatever you can. So, I mean, and Google's always trying to open source stuff as well. So I just try to personally try to always work at a company that seems to at least appreciate open source and tries to give back. I don't expect them to be like a red hat where everything is open source but at least to appreciate what it is and if they do use it to at least be willing to give back for it. I think there was a question in the back. No? Okay. I've got you one more question. Uh, Python, 10 years from now, what are your predictions? No more Python 2.7, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, drop the mic, though. Uh, God, Python in 10 years. Um, Honestly, just more of the same. I mean, I love this community. I just hope it continues to be fantastic. Um, I hope I still have fun contributing to Python itself. Um, I hope I still enjoy working with Larry and everyone else on the team. Um, and it just keeps growing and keeps making people productive and happy. And that's basically it. I mean, the 2.7 jokes just because I'm tired of supporting 2.7. But, um, yeah, that's really it. I really just want to just continue to do this for fun and come out to places like this and meet great people and just enjoy myself. Oh, Larry has something to add. <laughs>
just I don't know, a weird comment. Python 10 years from now, uh, Guido has said publicly that he thinks the version number 3.10 doesn't make sense. So after 3.9 will be Python 4.0. Um, he says we're not going to break everything this time, though, so. <laughs> I suspect we won't, unless Larry gets his dream of cutting out the gill, in which case maybe we will, maybe we won't. Um, yeah, that's the other, yeah, I also don't expect this huge 2-3 schism to ever happen again. Uh, we just did it because we knew we had to, because strings suck in 2, as I'm sure most of you know, and they don't suck in 3. Uh, but I don't expect this to ever happen again, so it should be nice and smooth and continue on once all of you come to the right side and start using Python 3. Yeah, we got time for a few more questions. All right. well, at the risk of forcing you to belabor the obvious, how right. do strings suck in 2 and how do they not suck so much in 3? Well, okay, so the background on the reason we made the changes we did for Python 3 was basically in Python 2, it is not clear when you have, for instance, a string, right? Is that byte data or is that textual data, right? It's binary stuff versus string stuff, text stuff. Python 2, you don't know that unless you've been really good about keeping track of what that string object represents. Python 3, it's bytes or it's star. That's it, you know exactly what's what. There's no mixing up, there's no trying to decode something that actually was already string and doesn't make any sense, or trying to encode bytes, it's already bytes. There's none of this mix up. A lot of projects who have port actually ported from 223 have actually found bugs, even if the porters complain. Like Kenneth Wright has said, yeah, I hated porting, but everyone wanted me to. But he also admitted that he found bugs in requests when he did the port, and I've heard that from pretty much everyone who's ever done the port. Because the subtlety and the implicitness just does not work well. And I mean, one of the tenets of Python is explicit is better than implicit. And that was one of the reasons we decided, okay, we have to make this change now before the language gets too big and too popular. Because the hope is, is 10 years from now, we'll all still be programming Python, which means there'll be much more Python code in the future than there has been in the past. And if we waited longer to try to do the switch, it wouldn't work, it'd be too painful. And it would be this one weird language that somehow doesn't really treat Unicode as a first class citizen like .NET and Java and Go and pretty much every other language, Ruby. And we'd be this weird little bastardized language that just doesn't seem to care about the world enough. And we do, I mean, we're internationalized. We want to be able to support anyone in the world. And that requires proper Unicode support, which we didn't really have very good support for in Python 2. So we did it in three and bit the bullet and have made this unfortunate little pain to do the conversion of what we still think is best for language long term. And for everyone involved. And Ellen agrees, so there you go. Yes? So, um, I'm, I'm, this is, I've just heard the best explanation of the difference between strings in two and strings in three, so thank you. Thank you. But now what I want to know is if I've got a program written in version two, yes. and it's got this latent bug in it yes. because of the confusion of the strings. Yes. When I run the two to three conversion program. Don't run the two to three conversion program. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run two to three. What should we be running? What? Okay, glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another document I wrote was I actually am the author of the official porting how-to. So if you go to docs.python.org, there's a link to how-tos, and the first one is porting from Python two to three. Uh, Actually, uh, almost exact, a little over a year ago, uh, I took all my 20% time at Google to try to um, fix the tooling in the community and to support the um, possibility of writing code that works in both two and three simultaneously. Because um, there is a very usable Python two and three subset. Um, and there had been some tooling around it and the community overall seems to have moved towards that, but the tooling wasn't fleshed out. So I took some time. I um, Took the mod I joined the Modernize project and built that out so that it'll actually port your Python 2 code to code that works in 2 and 3 simultaneously. Um, whether you want to use 6 or not as a dependency. Uh, there's now, I helped add a dash pi pi, a dash dash pi 3k flag to pylint that will actually warn you about things in Python 2 that will not work in Python 3. Um, there's already, already the dash 3 flag in Python 2.7 to give you some pi 3k warnings when things won't be compatible. Uh, there's uh, a dash B flag in Python 3 that will warn you about weird little byte stir comparisons and in Python 3.5 we made it um, warn you when you compare int to string because that can be a problem when you index because in Python 2 when you index off of bytes slash stir you get back a single length string but in Python 3 with bytes you get back an int and that will always compare true or false but it won't get what you want. Now that will actually warn you and say 
hey, I think you're doing what, not doing what you want. So at this point, you should actually now be able to write code in Python 2 and run it in 2 or 3, and at some point between those two interpreters, get a very loud warning if you turn on warnings saying you are doing something that you probably did not mean to do and it's semantically not what you're going to expect in one version or the other. So that's why I say don't run two to three. There's other tooling, so you don't have to do the whole jump over, which also means, and something I tend to say, start porting today, right? If you can write code that works in two and three, you can do it module by module. Any code you write starting today or tomorrow, because I don't know how many of you are going to go home and code tonight, um, start writing in the subset that works, because it just makes it that much easier in the future to just flip a switch and suddenly start running in Python 3. So. It can be done um, gradually. It does not have to be done whole hog at once using two to three. You can actually do it bit by bit. So, sorry if that started your question. Does that answer it more yes. or less? Like, yes. So we now have this explicit type in Python. What's your opinion on typing in Python? <laughs> what is my opinion on typing in Python 3.5? I see Larry smiling with a slight, <laughs> keeping his mouth shut grin. Uh, well, okay, so here's the deal. I do some coding on web stuff in my spare time. I've done it in TypeScript, I've done it in Dart, and the ID support for both because of the type hints is kind of handy. Now, I'm not about to type hint every single buddy thing in my code, but for anything that's public API, I definitely don't mind it. Honestly, I think it's nice if you bother, even if you don't, I really don't care. It's one of those things where it's great for code editors. It can be nice for running your um, code on top of to do some checks, especially if you have a public API. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I'm not about to add types to all my locals or anything internal to my APIs because I am in charge of those. I don't have to worry about people knowing that that's the contract I'm making because otherwise, I mean, half the time you say, this argument is going to be a dictionary or some mapping or something. So you might as well just stick it there anyway and just make it part of the documentation of the actual code of the, of the function or method and just leave it out of the doc string. Um, so that's the kind of pragmatic view I take. Um, so we're really, <laughs> someone's not happy about typing. Um, <laughs> basically, it's also just an open question. It is a, like the typing module, for instance, is provisional in Python 3.5. We could still totally rip it out. It's mainly there to see if people use it and like it. I mean, because some people who are like big IDE users and like doing their uh, documentation that way, love it. And then you talk to other people like, oh my God, you, we're gonna burn in hell for this. And it's just different opinions. The whole point is you don't have to do it. Now, some people who do libraries feel like they're gonna get forced upon them. I don't totally buy that. Like TypeScript, for instance, doesn't force all JavaScript programs to do it. There are projects like definitely type that actually keep a GitHub repo of like, external files that met, that specified the types for you. So other languages have found solutions to this and they have not collapsed under the weight of types. So I think we're a little too allergic to the idea. Uh, Larry probably disagrees. Um, no, okay, great. Um, so I, I'm just, I think they're useful for what they're useful for and I don't think we should go overboard, but basically what I said. Yes. Last question. Uh, last question. To continue on the whole type, I actually came across a library the other day that is using the type hints as an optional validator then for what you put into it. Like you can set a flag and say, now it, it, it's a wrapper for some communication APIs. And uh, I was just wondering if you think that's kind of a, an abuse of the type hinting, mm -hmm. making it almost like, well, I don't want it to be type hints, I want it to be a type function. Um, so the question is, do I think it's abuse to basically add decorators and such to your code where you've had the type in stack to make it do type checking at runtime? Yeah, I, I'm not down with that idea, personally. <laughs> now that being said, I did write the pip that defined um, signatures for functions in, in the inspect module, and one of the examples I gave was literally a decorator that would do the exact same thing, but that was just an example. I did not ex want people to actually use it, although I have gotten the emails occasion about that thing. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the type hints, if you're going to do it, it should be offline. It's not meant for runtime. It's not meant for that overhead. It's meant to just statically check your code to see if there's going to be a type problem. And if there is, then you get to know it, but it should not be a runtime thing. Just like it's not in Dart, and just like it's not a th one in TypeScript. All the languages that make this optional have learned that it's not worth the overhead. It's not what, that's not what it's about. It's about just offline checking when you do, like, your commit to your repo, run the check, just like running PyLint, and just see 
if something blew up. And that's when I think you should do it. Final thoughts? We don't have to have it all. Yeah, not specifically. Okay, no. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, so now it's a quick break, five, ten minute break, everyone. So we're, we're going to have Alice Jung next, but we're going to kind of do this introduction in a weird way. Because I wanted to give Brian an, an opportunity to introduce Alice because he's really impressed with all of her work and all of her achievements. But um, So I'm going to actually introduce Brian Ray right now. So there's kind of three people without whom um, Puppy wouldn't exist. So Larry Hastings was here earlier. So very early on, Dusty and I met with Larry Hastings and he very generously offered to be available for talks if we ever needed him. So having somebody who is a world-class speaker like Larry in our backyard available really gave Dusty and me a lot of confidence to get this group started. And then the person who got um, Dusty, Larry, and me connected was Yannick Kingris. So he um, used to run the uh, Montreal Python user group. Um, he was a co-chair of PyCon in Santa Clara, and he runs Startup Row for PyCon with me. Um, the third person is Brian Ray. So I got involved in the Python community um, visiting Brian, and we became best friends working on one of my capers where we, I was going to try to get us um, like Harper Reed, Adrian Holvati, Mike Caffarella, Brian, and a bunch of other people to do an open source tour in China to the point where um, we ambushed a United Airlines executive with Adrian showing up to the meeting. And we introduce Adrian and go, yeah, this is Adrian Holabody. He created Django. And she goes, yeah, I know who you are. Oh. <laughs> I don't think she was pleased. So we didn't get the sponsorship. <laughs> so here, here's Brian. Thanks, Don. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah, Don is amazing, and I'm very sorry for anything he's done to anyone. I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> you know, uh, machine learning in its current state, you know, is a big buzzword. Python's become a big buzzword. I think Alice was there, and I was in the Python side probably before it was a big buzzword. I like to say that, establish that first, right? Yeah, I was into data before it was big. We were, we, <laughs> we were, we, yeah, we were cool. And I came out from Chicago just for this, and that's a big life. I actually came out to hang out with Don all week, so I submitted a uh, proposal to my company to pay for it. Am I being recorded? <laughs> so I, I had to give a presentation, so I just did it. So you're going to get that after Alice's, but Alice's, I've seen some previews of the work. I'm really impressed with Dotto. If you're into scientific computing, dig deeper into Dotto, the S-frames and stuff. I'm very impressed with it, and I'm very, very excited to introduce Alice. Let's hear it up for Alice. Hear it? introduction um, so I I also want to, just to complete the circle um, I'm not gonna Don of course is a man who needs no introduction but I just want to express my gratitude um, not just for inviting me to speak for which I'm very honored um, but also Don I, I co-organized I started to co-organize um, the local data analytics and machine learning meetup in Seattle and we got so much help from Don along the way. And he's basically my meetup mentor. And I, I just have so much respect. And you know, I look at how this guy operates, and I'm just in awe. Like, you, this is a really, really vibrant community. I don't know if you guys realize how precious, precious it is to have this kind of a turnout on a cold December dark night. Um, <laughs> well, okay, that, that explains some, some of it, um, but that's, I think, a large part due to Don's work. Um, so let's give Don a hand. <laughs> okay. Brian knows a joke. I get no affirmation from my wife. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Um, okay. Um, so what I, my, my background is in machine learning, and thank you, Brian, for such a glowing introduction. It makes me blush. Um, 
but I so I've been in machine learning for a long time and it has become a hot buzzword these days and what I want to talk about today is hopefully it's it's an ambitious it's ambitious for 30 minutes um, I want to give you a real sense for some of the key concepts in machine learning how many people here have dabbled or done any machine learning or data science projects that's awesome okay cool great um, Please ask questions. I only got three hours of sleep last night. Um, so any question, the more questions you ask, the less likely that I'm to fall asleep at my own talk. Um, um, so interrupt me at any time. So um, uh, to give you a little bit more about where I come from, I started at UC Berkeley. I was there for my undergrad and grad school. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon for a postdoc. And then I went to Microsoft Research, um, and I was a machine learning researcher for um, like almost seven years there. And in the two years ago, I moved to Datto. And so, if you, as I look at my trajectory, I see kind of starting from my undergrad degrees were in uh, computer science and math, and in grad school I studied machine learning, and I started to apply it to. Um, actually problems in um, using machine learning to debug software, which is a really fun project. And, and then, um, so it's basically applied machine learning, which I think of these days as data science. Um, and then I started to work on more and more projects at Microsoft Research, and I realized a huge bottleneck in um, how, how can I, as a machine learning person, advance the field? And, and I see the field as bottlenecked on, it's supposed to be an applied field, but there are, there's a drastic shortage of people with knowledge and good tools to do things with it. So that drove me to move to Datto to build machine learning tools. We have a platform with a Python front end, C++ back end. I'll show a little bit of, of the open source part, the S frame, um, uh, data frame for machine learning tasks specifically. Uh, I'll give a brief demo at the end. Um, so, and more recently, actually, as recently as a month ago, I kind of I'm taking a little detour. I'm on leave from Datto right now, um, working on a book on feature engineering. So. So all of this is to set up machine learning and features. So to motivate, why are we even talking about machine learning? Um, just think about all the companies these days who are trying to make, uh, who are already making headway in their key applications, LinkedIn, Netflix, Uber, demand prediction. Um, you know, a lot of companies and any business with um, a lot of data, a lot of customer intelligence data are trying to use some of the, apply some of the machine learning techniques to extract insight from their data and make predictions based on that. So machine learning is good for modeling data, making predictions and building intelligent applications. Um, and for someone who's doing this, if you look at the machine learning pipeline, uh, a really simplified view is we start from raw data, which can take a variety of forms, like image or text and sound or logs, um, usage logs, web activity logs. And someone needs to merge, well, clean and merge these different sources of data and um, transform them into what's usable, what's known as features. And then those features are the, one, the things that get passed into a model and the model can then be deployed in production to generate predictions live. Um, and there's, it's an iterative process. So you might realize halfway through um, the modeling process that you don't actually have the right data or the data was dirty or you didn't featureize correctly. So you have to go back to the beginning and do it over again. And once you start to get, start to make some predictions and observe how users are reacting to them live, then you, that also informs the whole process and then go back to the beginning of the process and iterate. So it's, it's, it's a multi-step multi, multi -step process. And what I just wanna concentrate on tonight is this mysterious 
um, representation called features. So if, I think there's three key things to know about applying machine learning. Um, one is you need features, which are basically numeric representations of data, of raw data. And from there, you build models, which I think of as mathematical summaries of features. And in order to make something that works, in order to make a model that actually gives you the kind of output that you want, um, you have to choose the right model and features based on the data and the task. So um, it's, it's, it's not like you just settle on a model or you just settle on, the, on, on a set of features or you just, um, or even just settling on a kind, particular kinds of data source. It's, it's like a jointly op, joint optimization problem. So let's talk about features. Does this, make, does this make sense so far? Kind of. Um, might not seem relevant. Does it seem relevant? Yeah. <laughs> OK, cool. OK, so I said that features are numeric representations of raw data. So what does that mean? So if we look at, um, take raw text, take natural text. So I have a sentence. It says, it's a puppy, and it's, it is extremely cute. This is the suppose this is raw data. How would you uh, and I and I um, the question that that I'm asking myself is how would I featureize this? How would I turn this thing, which obviously doesn't look like any numbers, how would I turn that into some numeric representation that then math can understand? So, any ideas? Yeah. What does the word it mean? What does the word it mean? I, I don't know how deep do you want to go. <laughs> I mean, like, like it's it's. Um, oh, you mean in the sentence in or sentence. or like a grammatical in, construct? In, in, that sentence. <laughs> in the sentence, it's just I don't know. You know, like you get data that just appears. You don't know where the data comes from. Sometimes you you can try to make guesses, mm -hmm. um, but this is what you're given. So yeah, you don't you don't know. Let's, let's say. It is a puppy, <laughs> as the text says. It is some object. It is pointing to some object in the world. Um, so, yeah. So are you trying to do like automatic feature extraction, or do you have like some end goal where you can say, oh, I, I kind of know this kind of goal, and so I, I think maybe like the adjectives are important. Okay. Uh, good, great, great point. So the question is, do I want to do automatic feature extraction? Um, uh, and are the adjectives important? Well, I think, I think was, what he said that's most important is, do you have an end goal in mind mm -hmm. that directs you for picking out how to, what's important? Yeah, so, that, so that's, you're speaking my thoughts. So <laughs> okay. exactly, that's exactly the point. You, you have to extract, fe the feature has to be informative towards the end goal. Um, so let's say that the goal is, I want to classify I, I want to classify, given an input sentence, whether the sentence is about puppies or not, whether it's about, or maybe whether it's about pets or not. Okay, so anyway, so there's there's a variety of ways that we can, you know, we can think about, okay, what's a really important piece of information that I can extract from this sentence, either automatically or by hand, like I can define specific keywords. But what, um, one of, one kind of features that's really easily easily extractable and surprisingly um, useful and widely useful is called bag of words. So it's really simple. You basically turn a sentence, which actually has a lot of structure, right? It's a sequence. Um, there, there's you can, as English speakers, you can pick out noun, verb, um, object, subject, that kind of relationships. Bag of words gets rid of all of that. Okay. It's just unstructured. It just converts a sentence into um, a bag of word counts. So for each possible word in the vocabulary, it counts how many word, how many times does that word appear in the sentence and um, keeps that count. And if the word doesn't appear, then it has a count of zero. So what that gets turned into is um, called a sparse vector representation. So I can take that dictionary and I can represent it as something like a long vector. So now we're getting into um, math domain. 
So I think, you know, this is when I was studying machine learning, one of the things that I was um, very frustrated about is it's full of math. <laughs> and it, I like math, but I kind of have to have some motivation in order to, you know, parse through all, and it's almost disconnected. One. There's math books with pictures and math books without pictures. So what I want to do today is I want to, um, most of the time machine learning textbooks now go on to the next step, which is modeling. Oh, you know, you have a vector. That's all we need. Let's go on, move on to the next step of math. But I want to actually um, have us basically to just spend the next 20 minutes or so to try to visualize what do these features look like. And that's important because it gives you that intuition as a practicing data scientist. If you have an intuition of what something looks like, um, then you might over time accrue intuition about what is the right feature, right? What, what should the right feature look like? That's the million dollar question in, an all of, in a lot of applications. Um, here's a, one of my, I really love this quote. It's from a book that talks about this Russian mathematician, Gregory Perlman, um, who proved the Poincare conjecture uh, a few years ago. And this reporter, um, journalist, says, crudely speaking, mathematicians fall into two categories. The algebraists who find it easiest to reduce all problems to sets of numbers and variables, and the geometers who understand the world through shapes. Which kind are you? <laughs> Geometers? Algebraists? I, I'm, I think I'm a geometer, but I, I, like, I think algebra is really useful in uh, a way that I'll illustrate. So as a toy example, I want, and, and it's a fun example, I think. Let's start by visualizing a sphere in 2D. Uh, this is a circle, right? This is a circle. And we all know how, what, what defines a circle geometrically. All the points are equal distance from the center. So I can take a vector and I can s basically sweep it. Right? That's one way of thinking about how the circle is generated. So algebraically, in um, this kind of coordinate, I can write, this is what, I, I can write this, e this formula, this is really important because the Pythagorean theorem basically ties geometry to algebra. It's the basic theorem that ties Euclidean geometry to numbers and symbols. Um, so I can write this distance as the sum of squares of its two coordinates. It's actually pretty miraculous. But using this, we can write down the formula for this first circle. Right? Okay, so that's, that's easy. Now, what about a, a sphere? What about a 3D sphere? What does that look like? It looks like that. We've all seen balls. We know what that looks like. Um, and that is the algeb algebraic equation for a 3D sphere. It means all three, the sum of squares of all three coordinates added together equals to a constant number, the radius squared. Okay, so what about a sphere in 4D? <laughs> we live in time and space. <laughs> Any guesses? Huh? Just showed us with t equals zero on the last slide. I showed you with t equals zero. Okay. Okay. No, no, that's that's actually a really key observation. So I showed it to you at t equals zero. That's the present present time, right? That's a sphere. What 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 about when t equals one? I would assume it is swelling and contracting just the way the um, the um, is drawn. No, exactly. It's the sphere is swelling and contracting. Why? Because in, at the beginning, the the dots are far from something, and as time passes, they get closer, and as time passes, they get further again. And because. Right, so analogy to let, let's just stare at this because so as so this is where algebra becomes useful because as soon as we go beyond 3D, 
um, our imagination is stretched. We can't, we can't see beyond 3D. But this is where having this equation tells us exactly what this is, right? So if we set t equals to 1, if we set t equal to 0, then we just get the original 3D sphere. That's true, absolutely. What if, what if t is equal to 1? Then the only x, y, z that satisfies this relationship is 0, 0, 0, right? So I, what about t equals to negative 1? Same thing. Same thing, right. So that so right there we've described based on these endpoint the endpoint analysis we've described the sphere in 4D. So you can actually um, right it's not a static object but I can visualize it as a dynamic object. So basically something that blossoms out of nothing blooms into full form at the present time and dies off at some equal time in the future. And that is. What's the joke? Uh, <laughs> is this some <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like you guys are you guys are like like you know you're basically speaking my slides for me. <laughs> that was gonna be my next slide. Seriously, no, no, no. I, it, just watch. Um, Don't make us disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, before we go there, um, before we get all philosophical and life death ish. Well, why why are we looking at spheres? I you know, but besides the fact that it's just really fun to think about these things, and you can try to like mentally imagine what's a five D sphere. What does a five D sphere look like, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a try. <laughs> Do some algebra. Um, uh, so basically, the Poincaré conjecture that I mentioned um, a minute ago proves that essentially a sphere is. Basically, it's it's mathematically it's a um, home, home, homeomorphic. It's basically the same shape as a cat, <laughs> um, or a tree, or a baby, or a human being, or you know. Basically, it means that a lot of these three D objects, um, and in you know. So basically, the Poincaré conjecture says that any any shape in some dimension, in any dimension that is simple and connected basically with no holes is pretty much equivalent to a sphere in that it enjoys some of the same mathematical properties. So instead of analyzing all these complicated shapes, uh, mathematicians can just analyze spheres and ha know that the properties, the, whatever results they come up with will translate into all these real objects. And of course, the power of higher dimensions is a sphere in 4D can model the birth and death process of real objects. And uh, I'll skip that part for now. Um, and and high dimensional features is, are powerful. They can model a lot of things. Um, I'm going to skip that a little bit. Um, and let's let's now go back to the bag of words representation that I talked about earlier, and think about what that looks like. So I have a sentence. It is a puppy, and it is extremely cute. I converted it uh, into um, a sparse vector representation. It's a bunch bunch of numbers. So I can't visualize all of. I can't visualize the entire vector at one time. Uh, the best I can do is pick two or three words out of that and look at that subspace. So if I pick the words puppy and cute, then this sentence is a point in that 2D space, right? It has one and one on both coordinates. And I can pick one more word, so I pick extremely. Um, and you can lay out a bunch of sentences in this three-dimensional space. And this is, so basically a collection of documents now become a point cloud in high dimensional space, which we can visualize, but only two or three dimensions at a time. So next step, modeling. Model is, I said, it's a mathematical summary of features. Why do we need summaries? Because they're smaller. <laughs> because they're smaller than the original data. Yeah, and data is also really messy. So we, you know, we looked at this really 
pretty sphere that does things on the screen. But data looks something like this. It's just like, it's a bunch of samples and you, you, you don't see the entire sphere. You see some random samples of it. And even worse, it's noisy, so it could be like some a little bit off of a sphere, even a little bit smaller than the sphere. So that's the data that you actually have. And a document point cloud, you know, can just look like like a blob in in the in the space. Um, so we want models that summarize data. Classification, um, where the task is deciding, uh, given the given the data point. Um, decide whether it's puppy or not. Decide whether it's a positive or a negative. And the model is, you can think of the model, uh, a very simple model is basically drawing a line in that high dimensional space to separate the two classes. Clustering, it's basically grouping the, grouping similar data points towards each other. So it's kind of like finding these, um, bounding circles or bounding shapes around um, around the point cloud. And regression, now I, I've switched, so the y-axis is a feature and, and sorry, x-axis is a feature and y is the value that you're trying to regress to, that you're, the value that you're trying to predict. So think of this, pretend it's like some company stock information, um, where y is the stock price and x is time. So regression, the regression model tries to find a simple shape that kind of closely aligns with the data that you observe. Okay. Questions so far? You all with me so far? Awesome. Uh, okay. I was gonna say if you guys can give the next part of the talk too. <laughs> but next we're gonna talk, we're, next we're gonna think about what does feature engineering look like? So, you know, I've generated some features and I've showed you what a model looks like. Now when we start to, is, um, so feature engineering is basically transforming, figuring out all kinds of different ways of turning raw data into useful features so that the modeling step becomes easier. You know, like maybe if I'm trying to build a classifier, if I have features that show the two classes clearly separated in the space, then that would be, those would be really good features to have, right? So feature engineering is about kind of, given the task, figuring out the right space to position the data in. Um, and it's really fun when you start to think about what is actually happening in, um, in visually. So let's, for example, let's, Let's think about what can go wrong with bag of words. So let's say we have four sentences. It is a puppy, it is a cat, it is a kitten, and that is a dog and this is a pen. And I, I, I'm low on imagination. <laughs> um, and we say we have three words. We're just looking at the space stand by is, puppy, and cat. So you see there's like a bunch of, um, these points have different counts for the word is. But the problem is that it is, this actually doesn't, doesn't help you towards a classification task. It's just adding fluff instead of information. And in English language, there's lots of these kind of words like it. <laughs> it is also kind of a vague word that for a bag of words doesn't really give you a lot of a whole lot of information. You might be able to infer information from it by using words around it, but bag of words lost all that information, right? So there's there's just word bag of words is really simple to create um, the, the representation, but it creates a bunch of junk. So how do we clean it up? Um, one idea is to is to play with the word counts so that the really popular words, the words that kind of don't have a lot of meaning that appears in a bunch of documents are discounted. You just don't care about them as much. Um, so now this is a, a, some, some math. There's something called the term frequency, which is, which is basically a word count. The number of times the term appears in the document um, and then the document frequency is the number of documents in which this word appears in. So if a word, ignore the math equation for a second, if the word appears in a bunch of documents, 
it likely is not going to give you a whole lot of information about the ultimate classification task. So this, that's, that, this is a heuristic that uses that idea and says, okay, let me count the number of documents in which this word, each word appears in, and let me divide the word count by the document count, or by some transformation of document count. And that's exactly TFIDF. Uh, which some people might have heard of. So if you look at it visually, this is the original, um, this is our original space, this is the bag of word space. And once we normalize, it essentially, it, it divided by the document count. So now, oh, sorry, the Z axis should be labeled is. Um, so now, essentially, there's no more noise in the Z axis and that, feature, that whole feature can essentially be ignored. This word doesn't matter. So we kind of flattened the point cloud into flattened out the uninformative dimensions. There's another way, uh, there's another thing called PCA. How many think people have heard of PCA? It's often mentioned, principal component analysis. A lot of machine learning books also mentioned it and you know has a bunch of nice looking equations describing what it is. Um, but here's a visualization of what, what PCA is another way of trying to reduce useless dimensions, but it uses a different heuristic. It says, let me look at the document point cloud and I, I want to find the, the direction in which this point cloud varies the most. There's a lot of variability, right? Um, and that will be my principal axis. That's my principal direction of variation. Why is that, in, why is that interesting? What does this mean? Say, say I have, say I have puppy and puppy on the y axis and cat on the x axis. What would it mean when, you know, the principal directions point off in that direction? You've shown that they correlate. And so it might be interesting to look for outliers, but until you've drawn that line, you don't know what's an outlier. And they correlate, and you could possibly find outliers. You've been studying ahead. <laughs> <laughs> they do correlate. So what this means, what that direction of a line, the positive slope, means that if you have more counts of cat, the document is likely to have more counts of puppy. And that means you know these two words co-occur frequently together. And when when things co-occur frequently together, uh, when we're analyzing that document, it means that we don't kind of you know if if every time the word cat occurs, the word puppy occurs, then I can just represent that with one word, right? I don't need two words to to describe them. So there's some degree of redundancy when things correlate with each other. So PCA is good at picking out that direction of correlation and find out the principal direction of variation and the secondary direction of variation. But anyway, so if I want to do a PCA projection after figuring out in which direction they most correlate, um, it basically flattens the data onto that principal direction. So it's a different way of flattening data. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick demo now. And I started IPython earlier. No. Where did it go? Did I just close it? Option shift in should be that. Option shift T, right? Option shift. Okay. Next time, press the green button. Uh, lesson learned. Okay. I'll just restart it. Green button. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. So 
Uh, let's see if I can view toggle header. Toggle toolbar. Okay. So here I'm applying PCA to a data set um, using. Using, I'm going to use matplotlib to to plot what the PCA looks, uh, what the results of PCA look like. I'm using graph lab, which is Dado's um, machine learning platform. But you can the uh, functionality that I'm using today is only using the S frame part, which you can install separately as an open source package. So you can also do pip install S frame and um, and get everything that's needed here. Um, so I have a bunch of Yelp reviews. So what this does is it's reading it in as a CSV. And as we can as we will see, uh, it's actually a pretty complicated JSON. Um, each line is a JSON file. And it's a data set that Yelp released a while ago. Um, I think it's a bunch of restaurant reviews. And it does a bunch of it loads the whole thing in um, as an S frame, and then it unpacks the each of the JSON um, the JSON column and it automatically basically populates uh, something like this so instead of let's see so if I look at the raw file Yelp Yelp training business Oh, oh, thank you. It looks something like this, right? It's kind of ugly. It's um, uh, it's actually an, it's actually nested. The votes is a nested dictionary within this JSON file. Anyway, so um, this is up on GitHub, and I can send out the link later, and you can take a look at it. But basically, um, with that, with those few lines, I just unpacked this bunch of JSON file into a more or less readable um, data frame. It has a business ID, date, here I can, I think I'm done, thank you. Um, it has a business ID, date, review ID, the number of stars the review gave, the actual text of the review, um, what type it is, um, the ID of the user who wrote the review, and these votes. So people voted whether something is cool, funny, or useful. So if I do PCA, if I load PCA, the PCA package from um, scikit-learn and run PCA on just the votes, funny, cool, and useful, and see how what 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 are what's the what's the pattern that people vote in, and I plot the result. It looks looks something like this. So this axis this axis is cool. This axis is funny and the y-axis is useful. So the principal direction, uh, if we look at it, is um, the, principal, the principal component says that most of the variation in how people vote um, has explains the reviews where it has nothing to do with stars, um, but just if it's funny, then it's likely also to be cool and useful and vice versa but they don't really give you much information about whether or not the person actually liked the restaurant. So you can do um, some analysis of the principal components that came out of that as well, if you want. Okay, okay so that's, that's all I have. That's a really short demo to um, give you a taste of what PCA looks like. And this is my last slide. Oh, no, <laughs> this is my new last slide. Okay. Okay, well, anyway, so that's all the time that I have for today. Um, needless to say, there's actually a lot more to feature engineering we, that we could talk about. Um, if you're curious to learn more, there's actually an ongoing, right now, there's a Coursera ML specialization course that the CEO of, of, of Dado Carlos Gestrin and his wife, Emily Fox, um, from UW are co-teaching. It's on Coursera. 
and they will cover feature engineering at some later point in the this year. And I'm trying to write a book, but you'll have to wait for that for a while. Um, so feel free to get in touch with me via social media or email. Um, and thank you, and I'll take questions. Do I have time for questions? Yeah. Okay. Just repeat the questions when they ask you. Repeat questions. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes. Linear algebra. What's the most fundamental math knowledge to get started with machine learning? Um, so I started my leave a month ago, and I started to write, but I am having major writer's block. Mm -hmm. So instead, I started to reread my linear algebra textbook. There's a really good book by Gilbert Strang. He's, I, I think he single-handedly saved my mathematical career because his book is actually written for people, not for machines. Um, so he actually makes linear algebra understandable. Um, and I, so I just basically read, reread parts of that book and it's just a lot of fun for a certain definition of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Given the um, example of Yelp data that you were just showing us a minute ago, could you make up um, the sort of prediction that you might be able to make once you've done your all your analysis, because to me that's the whole reason you're doing this is to come up with cool predictions and exactly. win yeah. money at the track. So, yeah. what might you be able to predict? What sorts of things? Yeah, the question is with that Yelp data, with the Yelp reviews data, what might we be able to predict? Because um, feature engineering is fun and all, but what's the ultimate? You know, where's the money? <laughs> what's the task? Um, you can classify, you can predict, try to predict the score, you can classify sentiment uh, of the reviews, you can um, use it to do recommendations, so if you observe that users like this, this, and that, recommend, or and this user like two of the same things, and also another one, then you can uh, recommend this thing to the first user. Um, you can also do things like, I think there's timestamp, you can watch, you can, you can stalk users, or you can you can do a time series analysis of the users, um, maybe the users' usual. You can model users basically. They eat at noon and They uh, eat at noon. They probably work in this area, live in this area. You can you can find out all, all sorts of information about people. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> Um, other people have worked with reviews. I'm, I just rattled off a few, but I'm sure I'm forgetting other applications. Yeah, yeah? Uh, if you want to hear more about that particular data set, look up the Yelp data set challenge. The there, yes. They link to about 200 papers that have been published based on that, and they keep releasing more data in their data set and expanding the challenge. Yeah, the Yelp, great. Yelp Point. The Yelp data set, look up Yelp data set online. Um, there's about 200 papers that's been published. They they are now re they just released version six of the data set that has a lot, I don't remember how many reviews, but it has a lot of a lot of information from multiple cities. And it's all cleaned uh, and I think anonymized. Other questions? Well, I think we have time for one more. Yeah. So when you're analyzing like sentences like you were before with the bag of words, how would you handle compound sentences and sentences with negative words? Like, it is not a puppy and it is a cat. Yeah, so how would bag of words handle compound sentences, phrases, you mean compound, or, or, or sentences with not, like negation, yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't handle that super well. So it, a straightforward way of extending bag of words is called bag of n-grams. So instead of counting single words, you count sequences. Sequences of two, of three, but it, um, so single words, if you just count the number of unique single words in, in, a, in a document corpus, it might be like 10,000, 50,000. If you start counting two grams, then it very quickly blows out of proportion. And most of those sequences will probably not be useful because it's, it may be unique. You may maybe it just occurred once in that one sentence. So there's a lot of noise. Um, there's other 
NLP methods that can extract better features. And I think Brian that was a great segue. will talk about some <laughs> of them. I placed him there. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You guys want to keep going? Yeah. All right. Yeah. How many Seattle natives here? Okay, how many people drink coffee? So I dressed up as a barista today because I'm in Seattle. I'm actually from Chicago. I was here 20 years ago for six months teaching canoe in Auburn. Really fun. I really do love Seattle, and I try to come back here a couple times a year. So my excuse, I really wanted to see Don. Don and I have a great time together. We usually get in trouble, but uh, we have a great time. So never been in jail. Together. He wrote a. He wrote. I should tell him about Chinese New Year. No, I shouldn't. Uh, anyway, uh, he wrote a paper. He wrote a letter to my organization so I can expense this, and then I realized I had to do a presentation. So. <laughs> Uh, anyway, my background, 13, almost 13 years ago, I started Chicago Python User Group. And I'm going to plug in as I'm doing this. And my resolution will change. You'll get to see all my notes and everything, right? I'm trying to hide the URL. Hold on. Let me look. Um, I'm putting this on. Uh, I'm just going to do that. As I'm being set up. So, I founded the Chicago Python user group about 12 years ago. And um, why isn't this working? Okay, well, we're just going to show the URL. If someone hacks it while I'm presenting it, that's fine too. Uh, we are in Seattle, so it could possibly happen. So, the whole reason that uh, I did do the Chicago Python user group was because I was afraid it would die. I was afraid it just wouldn't happen because I was afraid that. You know, someone wouldn't pick it up. So there's not always Don's shoes laying around and stuff like that. People don't run it. And usually I don't speak. I, I speak really infrequently. And I, I, I was doing the math earlier, and I've done about over you know 200 meetups and 2,500 pizzas. <laughs> I haven't eaten those all myself, but uh, yeah. So anyway, so my day job now has become. I it was a hobby at one point. I mean, I was a consultant 20 years, so as a hobby at one point doing Python, and it turned out to be my career. And now I, I lead a group in enterprise science at Deloitte that takes, we have a bunch of scientists, so if there's any scientists in the room, <laughs> talk to me. And we wrap scientific models with really good engineering, which usually involves Python. I can't get through a conversation today with analytics without having Python mentioned. It's amazing. I thought, at first I thought they were doing it because I was in the room because I've been known to be in Python, but I realized they really are using Python everywhere. And there's a lot of R programmers and stuff moving to Python. Anybody sure? And uh, you know, it's really, a, it's a cool area to be in. Uh, Alice did an amazing talk just now about the science behind it. And I'm coming from like an entirely different angle. I'm like the fifth dimension here because I'm coming from like the engineering perspective, Python hacking Unix guy for a long time. And, and I've been that person in my organization as well, and I'm known for it. So I try to understand the science enough to make it work. And I also spend a lot of time traveling along talking to clients and making it work. So first, let's analyze some text. And if I, 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 pre, I, I apologize in advance if this is not a PG-13 uh, presentation, because there might be some vulgarities in there, but they're direct quotes, and uh, we could study in academia. Each of us is, a, is full of shit in our own special way. We are shitty little snowflakes dancing in the universe. <laughs> that's not Lewis Beck, that's Don Shute. <laughs> Let's give Don Shute a, hand, a round of applause one time, because he loves affirmation. <laughs> and he is dressed up as a North Korean dictator for Halloween. <laughs> Actually, that was our, pitch, our start of role, too, I think. Uh, anyway. So I, I directly ripped off one of Alice's slides, because I'm going to talk a bit about some feature engineering going on here. And by the way, if you see here, that I'm in Python 4, just for the record, right there. <laughs> That's what I'm, no, actually, it's 2 or something, and I, I, I hacked it. But, but I'm going to zoom in a lot. Look at that. I should have zoomed in right there. <laughs> Sorry, Don. He's not paying attention. Uh, so this is. 
this is Alice's actual slide. So I'm just gonna, I'm also gonna focus on this, but I'm gonna talk about text, and I'm gonna talk about tagging and parsing of text, and using those as features in some sense. So someone talked about the negative case. We're gonna talk about that in a few seconds. We're gonna handle that. Uh, and there's there's some debate about whether it makes sense sometimes. Sometimes using n-grams, which is a series of, of words, works just fine for picking up those cases as well. So sometimes you can get, end up overfitting or something like that. There's a lot of debate about this practice, but and sometimes you can get almost to where you want to get just by using TFIDF and a good model of random force, and you might be able to get to that point where you your clients are happy with the results. There's a lot of cases where machine learning is not being applied at all, and it should be. It's, it's all over. I, I have tons of clients say, oh, we just need to do, we like machine learning because it sounds good. Maybe they say, oh, I like how it sounds when I say machine learning. I can just talk about machine learning, but do they really know what it's about? Probably not sometimes. But in reality, when we start looking at data, it has a lot of application, and it brings a lot of insight into the data that you're dealing with day to day, and also it's very actionable. So I can take data from a consumer uh, facing, and they can type in a web form, and I can categorize that data, and I can increase operational efficiency, I can classify it essentially. And then at the same time, what we've learned in some cases is we can also identify really strange patterns that may be like risk mitigating, so the FDA is very interested in classification problems right now, the government is, and a lot of businesses as well. So, uh, instead of just reading my slides off here, which I'll probably do, basically there are some differences in tagging and parsing and chunking, um, and then I'm gonna talk about posh rules, which is an invention that I'm trying to push forward eventually. Um, we went over most of those, uh, but we'll go into those a little deeper. But from a very functional perspective, these are all tools right here that any one of us could pick up and start playing with. And I encourage us to do so. And I just picked these ones because they're the ones that first came up in Google as I typed it. <laughs> and I've actually used a couple of those. But um, NLTK gets a lot of heat lately, but it also is a very good reference. And it's something that's been that's become mature enough to have its rough edges as well, because it was done so long ago. But uh, so I, there's a lot of mixed emotions to talk about NLTK, but you'll always hear people reference it. And a lot of people come to Python through that direction. Similarly, has anybody here a web programmer, done Django or anything? Some people have come into Python from Django. So there's, there's sometimes entry points into the language where you start. So well, I have a reason. I have a reason I want to learn Python. I want to actually build something. And sometimes I've noticed that NLTK is one of those entry points. And it also wraps a bunch of stuff. And a lot of the stuff I showed here, it actually wraps as well. So I'm gonna actually execute code. I have, I have no slides. So I just execute code. Am I connected? Yeah. Kernel is ready. Here, sorry, I'm trying to type in. There we go. Um, this is on AWS, and actually it's wide open, so if someone really wants to ruin my presentation, they could right now. But I also um, installed everything on there, and I'll share the image if someone wants to play with it or something like that. So here's one of the libraries that's out there. And what we're gonna look at here, this is quite interesting. So we're taking that sentence, and we're actually looking at a tree that represents the sentence. And you can see how it breaks it up into chunks. So each of us is full of in our own special way. And that's, and that's, that's largely a premise. So think, going back to those who are mathematicians who are very uh, visually oriented, what do you call it? Uh, you had a word for it. Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, that would appeal to them. And these are just different libraries I'm gonna go through that are doing parsing here. So here's a, here is an actual sentence broken up into some parsing tokens here. So you can see the words here. These are the parts of speech here. We'll talk more about that. And then this is just yet another one. So these are, I want to go back up to my reference here. Some of these are written in Java, a lot of them are Python, a lot of them are wrapped with other things. And this is just another way to represent a, a language pattern. Um, So this is yet another way to represent a language pattern. And 
Uh, I'm probably just going through these and this isn't too interesting, but it'll get more interesting in a second. So Spacey, and I think we mentioned this one, is quite interesting. So these are all very similar to each other in a lot of ways. And I think that's my point, is that they all have kind of, they're built on to the idea of taking a corpus and applying that to uh, them up. And a lot of that background work of even making those corpuses and taxonomies and stuff, that's actually done with machine learning as well, if you look into the history of it. Um, so we're just getting data out of the language. And this is the same sentence parsed various ways. And some of these run much slower than others, by the way. So um, as that's running, have I lost anyone? Any questions about like what we're doing so far, as far as language? See, this makes a lot of sense, right? So the lemma here is a, a more normalized way. He, here are the parts of speech. Let me actually scroll down to where I, uh, where I have a, you will see what these are. So there's verbs in here, nouns, things like this, and these are chunked pieces of language. So is that clear to everyone? So basically, I, here, shoot. Uh, I just had two questions. Yep. Yeah, most of them do, um, and that's a great question. So most of them do, and language and machine learning, if you take a generalized approach to machine learning to apply to language and you don't use parts of speech in it, it actually works just fine. And that's something that people kind of forget. To get to that 80% of accuracy, and you're, you know, or 70% re recall, 80% precision or something. Sometimes you can get to it without even using something like this. Uh, but there are improving libraries in other languages. English is far dominant as far as uh, the, the corpus that are behind it, I believe. And, but you know, there are European languages out there. And there's, there, there's Asian languages as well. And this, this, these parts will be different. In fact, you know, since you brought that up, let me see if I can show this. As long as my internet's working. So, um, I don't have a, yeah, here you go. Here's a parser that's done uh, in Chinese. I believe this is Mandarin, traditional Chinese. And actually, these tokens are about as similar as ours. So, that's what that parse tree looks like in Mandarin. And Stanford's libraries are actually quite good uh, for parts of speech parsing and things like that. And they're quite widely used. So, um, and this is an online demo that you can bring up. So to answer that, yes, it is done in multiple languages. So. They change over time as the language changes? <laughs> That's a great question too. How do they change as the language changes? I mean, it really depends on how they're built. So, I mean, you, you I will get to that. So there is, um, the ideas of these taxonomies sometimes is they are not always provided. You know, you have uh, pen, uh, bank tangers, you have browns, you have, you have the ones that are kind of already built and curated over time, but you can also build your own. And we're actually gonna do that later in this demo. So we'll get to that. And here's a nice, and shows you each part of this step of how it breaks apart this language. And I can see how that's a section, and that's a section that turns into a sentence. And it's, it's quite interesting, actually. Um, and I'll show you why once we get to the feature part of it. Now, beyond sentences, so we've covered sentences really well. Now let's just talk about words for a second. So words themselves, too, they may have a common, uh, you know, ancestry, you may be able to have hypernyms and hyponyms, so they have synonyms. Everyone here's heard of a synonym, right? So we also have, you know, the root words, the base words, and all that, and I built a little graphical demonstration here, and this is all available on GitHub, by the way. If you're looking at a word, say I'm looking at dog, and I want to, you know, look at um, a working dog, and the Eskimo dog is a type of working dog, and so on and so forth. So you can start understanding the graph of how these words came to be. And it works in a couple different ways. This is a hyponym uh, from a different vantage point, if you're looking up instead of down. And this word is noise. We're gonna use that in a second. So 
if I'm looking at this graph, I got sound, which type of noise, a twang, a ting, a jingle. <laughs> it's very appropriate right now, a jingle. And, uh, and so on. So that's making a lot of sense, because everyone here uses words and understands how those, those come to be. Uh, so then I take some of Alice's Yelp data. This is a nice thing about Alice, who was nice enough to share some of her demonstration to me before, because I actually took some of the uh, false positives, and I took the text out of it, um, and I took some sentences out of it. I just played with it. And, and I'm really just playing here. But it, it is kind of getting the point across about how this language could work. So I took, uh, I took three sentences that in my mind represented bad sounds, like a bad sounding experience, like literally noise in a restaurant or whatever. And um, not bad sounds, it had also the words in there. And this gets back to the bag of words and why that may not always work is because these words sometimes collide, and this might help you negate that. It's hard, don't get me wrong, it's very hard to write a feature extractor that, that works in this way, that does this, but we're gonna, try, we're gonna try to do that right now live. Live in Seattle. So now I've loaded those sentences, and I'm gonna go ahead, and I'm using that pattern, or, uh, there's a library called Pattern, and I'm gonna use that Pattern library quite a bit here because it does a lot of the searching mechanisms in there that's already built in, and I like that. So here is that same graphs that I saw before, but they're just for those new sentences. So instead of the uh, Lewis Black sentence, we're using the sentences we got from Yelp. Uh, there's a guide here about these tagging, too, if you ever want to see this. Present. If you go back and get this off GitHub, there's a, there's a link to explain exactly how these different distinctions, uh, how they work. And I always have to refer to it too. Uh, my grammar school teachers would not be proud. No, no, they, they would not be proud. I, I forgot, oh, what's an adjective again? Wait, no. And then the chunks are quite interesting as well. So we broke up all those sentences and looked at them and looked at the parts. Uh, and now we're getting to the next step, which is we're gonna start searching for patterns. And what I found here, when I was looking at these and I'm just I'm doing this I'm doing this engineering just by hand. I'm just looking at it by hand and saying, hey, you know what? Those ones that have them as verbs sound as the verbs. Those are the those are the error cases. Those are the cases I don't really want to grab anything. Um, and so I go through and I write a test. Here's where I just set it up, and, and then I write a test for each one of these one by one. And I say uh, the sound in the first sentence. Uh, it's a noise is the base word. I can go back to that graph and look at noises and see how that correlates acoustics and not. And here's that question we had earlier in the blue shirt. So here's my rule right here for not. And I put those two together and not, not RV. Let me go back to my graph. What is RV again? And RV is an adverb. So not, right? Okay, that makes sense. And uh, and then these are the three ones that are, um, I want them to skip. And then, so that's making sense. So those are just like your assertions. These are like unit tests to me, right? The, these are just my assertions in the language. And I'm just going through. And then also supports this library, particularly supports these wildcards too, which is really nice, because I get all the types of verb in one statement. Ah, everything works. And then I can press it into one function here. So this is, some of these are repetitive, so I just broke it down to this one statement here. And then I look at it, and it, it identifies the sentences correctly. Go ahead. Did you basically write that nasty extraction function by yes. like solving a bunch of simultaneous equations on a piece of paper or something? No, I just, I did exactly like this. I mean, I, I literally did it in the notebook. You just glued all those things. I just glued them, I, exactly. I just saw, okay, this one's oh, the same as this yeah, one, right. and that, you know, and so on and so forth. And, and, it, and it wasn't pretty, no, it wasn't. Because so, I had it, it's not perfect. But I think if you can prototype, if you already have it identified, so this goes back to the premise of machine learning, right, too. You've already done some classification on you know, six Exactly. Classes, and you say, okay, now, what coefficients cause those classifications to come out exactly features exactly so and if I already have these identified so I, I mean I'm playing with it in a sense and, and I think at this step you've already gone through the bad words of doing it this so you're just trying to get that extra five percent 
right? You, you, already, you already got a good outcome. You're just trying to get it over this hump, right? And trying to get it slightly better. Um, and so that brings us to our machine learning example now. This is our final example here. And I literally just wrote this, so I hope it works. <laughs> um, so what this is, is I'm taking NHTSA data, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration data that's already labeled as uh, wrecks that are injured. People were injured in the wrecks or they were not. And I'm gonna take it, I'm, I, I, hope I take it, and uh, I'm going to machine learn on in a bit. So now I got my data, I have it stored in XML, so it, it pulls it in there. This is one of the records. This person's injured, so that's my label. My, you know. And I'm curious about the word injury too here. So I, I pull up another graph here. Injury, fracture, wrench. You know, quite a few injuries here. <laughs> Um, and then this is a case where I built my own taxonomy. So uh, basically what this is, is I'm gonna just do a bag of words here. This is a very simple model. This is like the one that's built, naive Bayesian model that's built into NLTK. It's as plain as it gets. It doesn't do anything brilliant at all. There's no magic behind it, but it's very transparent. And you'll find that with some models. Sometimes, you know, if you go to like a random force, like we had a presentation on earlier and stuff like that, it's kind of hard sometimes to track down the features and how that came to be, you know, why the decisions came to be. In this case, it's very transparent. And here is the function that I'm going to be injecting into my workflow that uses a taxonomy for her. And the other thing, I like the output I just like the how readable the output is when we go through and look at the um, most informative features. So basically, that's one of the interesting aspects of it. Is this executing? And it may take a while, actually. So while we're doing that, let me introduce, we'll let that run, and let me introduce uh, what I'm calling the posh syntax. And this is not yet published. You guys are the first people to see this. But um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take that very ugly code and condense it into a format that can be used to uh, prototype and run these rules against a large data set very quickly. So I have a posh library that I'm hoping to open source soon that can do it very quickly. And then there's a syntax that I'll, I'll keep separate, I'm calling it posh. Um, it stands for parts of speech heuristics, but we, it may change before because it doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes because it's not just about parts of speech. But this was just be this this is identical to this. This is to say that uh, you know if if you're in a scope of a sentence, look for these elements. Uh, not a verb with noise plus threes when you're thinking about the that tree, and you know adjective and so on noun with this acoustics, and all the way back to not here. And then that one line gets executed across a huge data set, and you can test it to see if it's working or not. Let's see how our classifier is doing. Has it given up? <laughs> 